Uh, thanks, folks, for, for uh, the on-time arrival. And thanks very much, Gianni, for putting all of this together. It's been it's, it's so much fun to hang out with folks. Um, and I hope we get to chat a lot. I'm just going to talk about one of the things we're, we're interested in, and I, I hope it relates to some of the things we've been hearing. I've tried to, to put these uh, notes together as, as these themes have been emerging. I think um, we're all excited about neural network potentials. It's obvious, right? They're amazing. They, they can fit to uncanny accuracy. Um, and I think the most fun comes when we really hit those accuracies. I think for folks that have been fitting classical potentials, we can get 5K cal with sort of bones and angles and dihedrals. Uh, we can get 3K cals with sort of cross terms and, and all sorts of uh, extra terms, classical terms, uh, and reactive, of course. Uh, and then there is sort of this barrier of adoption, which I think, you know, we were, it's, it's our job to convince people to use these tools to, to some degree. And I think Olex is, is the king of this, right? He's got the neural network that gets used the most uh, by actual people that are doing this for real. Um, and the question is sort of, how do we continue making these tools a, a standard? And I think inference at scale, right? Like how do we do this fast? And at scale, in you know, for, for ten thousand, for a hundred thousand atoms, uh, long versus short. So these are all themes that I think keep keep recurring. And I just wanted to give sort of my my quick summary. Uh, the lack of universality. I think that's not going to go away. And you will see. I like silicates, right? I really want to do silicates and sodium and, and, and calcium. There's no, you know, either if, if I don't train it, there's not going to be a force field for silicates, right? Because very few people have sort of the, the interest in making one of these big things. Uh, so I think universality is going to be a, a challenge. And then there's this whole trustability and holes, which I think is something that most people have done this in practice, have encountered. And this is what I'm going to be talking about for, for my next sort of 17 minutes. And, and I hope I, I'll, I'll have a, a good conversation with you folks. And on the other hand, I wanted to, I, I wasn't here, but I was told, by people that go to this conference uh, that uh, Roald Hoffman has apparently, you know, declared defeat and accepted that machine learning is gonna eat quantum mechanics uh, job over the last, uh, over the next years. Um, you know, this is, this is an, an old player, right? This, this guy has, he got the Nobel prize in chemistry in 81. He's, he's been around for a while and, uh, and he's worried that quantum chemists are gonna become uh, training data generators for us pretty much. So this, this is not some stranger talking about things. This, this is a, a visionary has been around for a while. Um, or maybe they'll go the way uh, supermarket cashiers and, and tax drivers, taxi drivers. So on that note, you know, I think, I think it's been a bit gloomy, but uh, you know, uh, I think it's on us to, to make this work. So I'm gonna talk about auto differentiation and uncertainty in machine learning potentials. And I'll, I'll quickly remind you how people, folks quantify uncertainty in machine learning potentials. Typically in, in deep network models, uh, folks do mean variance estimation to estimate um, aleatoric uncertainty. That would be random error on your data, not on your model. That would be the way to capture that your data can be noisy. If you're working with experimental data, somebody hinted that it's, it's a different world out there and experiments do have noise, but quantum chemistry doesn't really have noise, right? We, we're, we're good to numerical precision. You put the same input again, you're gonna get the same SCF answer with you know, 10 to the minus seven hard trees uh, accuracy. So depending on, on your convergence, apparently I said my convergence too tight according to, to some students. Monte Carlo dropout is a common in between to, to get some unsampling uh, for cheap. It's been proven not to be the best and the best uh, in practice so far is ensembles, which is again what Alex referred to. So typically we quantify the uncertainty of these neural network potentials by training an ensemble of them from random initial weights. They converge to different local minima so there's slightly different flavors. And when they agree, you have sort of some confidence that, that the model is working. And when they disagree, that's a reason to sort of stop. So we can get Bayesian four fields out of neural networks, right? This used to be one of the big advantages of GPs. They have sort of native uncertainty, but you can do pretty native uncertainty uh, with ensembles. So now think every time you call your, your force field, you get energies, you get forces, but you also get an ensemble of energies and an ensemble of forces. And that's how people typically do uh, uncertainty in force fields. And that's the driving force for, uh, for active learning. Because then if your model is uncertain at inference time, you can pause, decide that you need that data point back into your training data, run it with quantum chemistry, add it to the training data pool again and retrain. And of course, this is not as simple as I just put it because how many points are you going to gather? Right, like how, what, what is a sizable amount of extra data? You know, if, if you have 
the 20 million couple cluster calculations and you find like three uncertain points, what you do, you go back and train on 20 million and three, that's not gonna, you know, there's, there's, there's nuance about how to add data to these pre-trained models. Uh, and then there is nuance about how to do active learning in practice because um, the sampling for frames, typically, right, we, if you have a full explore, fully explored phase space at the beginning, uh, that's perfect training data. It really matches the distribution you're going to sample afterwards with your potential. Uh, but that would mean you already know the answer to your problem, which was what is the phase space, right? Like what, what is the distribution of states my, my simulation will visit? So there is this sort of a putting the horse before the, the, the chariot in terms of how you get a, a bunch of training data. And I will walk you through some examples of how this, this was a, a thing for us. Uh, so we were interested in, in making these kind of ethers, these kind of carbon oxygen uh, molecules to chelate lithium, to wrap around lithium, right? This, this is not, a, a, it's a non-covalent interaction. There is some electrostatics, some polarizability, Classical force fields with their point charges don't do great at this because they don't really polarize, you know, the, the polarization of the lone pairs and lithium is not great in classical force fields. So people hack it, they scale down the Coulomb point charges and whatnot. So we chose as a, as a model system to see how we can find a glime, one of these molecules that binds lithium the most strongly to make, to make battery components. So this has a flavor of configurational space of how these molecules wrap around lithium and has a flavor of chemical space of, you know, there's a few hundreds to thousands of ethers we could make with two, three, three, two lengths of carbon in between the oxygens, right, on these polyethers. So we wanna find what is the best chelation and the best interaction energy in this chemical space. And we thought this is a reasonable place to make a, a machine learning potential. Uh, this was, we were using SHNET at the time. Uh, so we start off, with some data that comes from uh, relaxations of clusters, right? So from gradient descent geometries that you visit when, when you relax things with DFT and some uh, normal mode sampling around equilibrium structure. So we get the normal modes, maybe with, with the same DFT or with XTB, move around the normal modes at a certain temperature, I think it was 500 Kelvin, gather some of those bones, get energy and forces, uh, pull all of these sort of about a thousand or a couple of thousand data points and train a force field. And, and the test loss, it's typically okay. We get on, on the held out data, we seem to be doing okay. We get the, you know, 1K cal, 2K cal, things seem good. Then we take that force field, we run the simulated annealing that we want to do to find this, this chelation uh, molecules, to find these poses, right? We run MD, we cool it down, and we see how lithium interacts with this, with this flexible chain. And, and we go and check how these frames, what the energies and forces look like for these frames. And now it's catastrophic, right? We're getting, we're getting errors of, you know, 10K cal per mole when things look good. So it turns out the distribution we're trying to sample and the distribution we trained on are mismatched. And this is the holes. This is what people have been calling holes, right? Your simulation visits either rare events or just common events that weren't represented properly in the training data. Uh, so if we've got a two dimensional embedding of what the training data compared to the phase space we visit, you can see the holes right there, right? Like the, the, the homogeneous circle would be all the states the simulation visits and the points are where the training data was. So I don't know how people do this in practice, but it, it, I mean, this is, this is sort of not always very explicitly stated, but it turns out you need to do a bunch of generations where you get uncertain frames, you run your simulation, visit some frames. If, more, if the ensemble is uncertain, you save some of those, you make them maybe get some RMSE uh, over Cartesian coordinates to make sure that they're unique, or maybe you compare the neural network embeddings to, to make sure that they're different, right? That you don't get, the, the same point over and over, and you retrain, and you can see we eventually converge to this outstanding zero, you know, one kilojoule per mole accuracy uh, and uh, kilojoule per mole Armstrong on the forces. But it took nine generations of this sort of blind active learning cycle of uh, train, run MD, get uncertain frames, uh, retrain, more MD, more uncertain frames. Uh, for reactive, uh, we, we did something similar for a post-transition state bifurcation. This is a reaction where the products depend not just, you know, there's, there's a, a barrier and then there is a shallow long valley uh, that can lead to two different products. So it's a dynamical uh, reaction where, where you get sort of different product distributions depending on, on trajectories that run along this, this valley. This is a standard thing that uh, Hauk did in 2019. So we took it as a, as a model system. It took them 
I don't know, 500,000 DFT calculations to characterize this with the ab initio molecular dynamics. And we said, well, it's, it's a close, you know, it's close enough. It's a few tens of atoms. So we can probably do this with a reaction, a neural network potential. And again, Schnett, uh, first time we calculated with Nash elastic band frames. So frames we visit along uh, uh, Nash elastic band paths from reactant to products. Um, we train a potential and we get 1K cal on the test data, right? This is held out test data from the, from the Nash elastic band. We train on, you know, we train on images one to 17 and we test on image 18 and the model is great. Then we try to run dynamics and we get 40, 30, 40 K cal error. So same thing again, we run dynamics, get the uncertainties, retrain, you know, the loss starts going down. And finally, the training data represents the same uh, uh, ensemble we wanna sample with your simulator and they eventually converge. And then these numbers are trustworthy and, and you know, we can check the solvent effects, we can transfer to double hybrids with big uh, basis set. Um, so we get to learn chemistry but it took whatever, five generations. Uh, so this is something that we found sort of concerning that we, we don't really have a good handle to go poke, punch the holes, right? Filling the holes in the potential. We need to wait for the simulator to bump into them, right? We, we, we explore the world one femtosecond at a time. And you know, when it eventually finds high uncertainty points, then we say, okay, we needed that point. And then we do the full production simulation again and say, well, turns out we needed that point too. So the, the way we thought about this to, to add some extra um, capabilities to this active learning is with, uh, with differential of all uncertainty. And you know, the forces we're getting come from auto-differentiation over the, over the energy. Um, so we can do auto-differentiation again uh, over the ensemble uncertainty, right? So this is what I have here. If we define the ensemble uncertainty over the forces, we did experiments with the energies and the forces, and it turns out uncertainty in the forces is more predictive of error in the forces than uncertainty in the energy is of error in the energy. So, you know, because they are derivative, right? They're more sensitive to all the issues of overfitting and typically force uncertainty is, is more informative than, than energy uncertainty. So we take the ensemble force and ensembling is a differentiable operation, meaning that, uh, that this derivative, uh, well, I don't have it, but the derivative of the uncertainty with respect to atomic positions is available to us. So we can literally distort the structure in towards the regions of high uncertainty. So instead of waiting for the simulator to bump into high uncertainty frames, we can do gradient ascent over uncertainty and, uh, and converge by, by gradient ascent on high uncertainty regions. And uh, in, in case anybody's uh, uh, keeping track, of course, a plasma of atoms flying around would be high uncertainty. So we need some extra grounding effect to, to stay within sort of the, the manifold of things we're interested in. So the way we do that is adding a, a likelihood based on the frames we've seen so far, right? We, we can always estimate the neural network energy for a, for a frame. So what we do is weight this uncertainty or the, uh, with, the, with the likelihood of visiting that point in molecular dynamics with a partition function that is made of the frames we visited already. It's not the perfect partition function, right? If there is another minima that we never saw, our partition function will be very biased, but it represents the phase space we've seen already, right? So this, this ties us to likelihood, right? To chemical configurational space we're likely to visit, and this is places where we're uncertain. So we put this thing together, these two uh, items together into this sort of adversarial loss, and then we can do gradient ascent on that, right? So we're gonna go uphill, towards points that are at the same time, high likelihood and, and high uncertainty. So I've, I've got a couple of examples on this. One is just this double well system where we start in one well and do MD in that well. So we've got you know, lots of, of samples within that well, but no evidence that the second well exists. Uh, and the model, of course, you know, it's very certain. This is the, this is the adversarial loss. Uh, so the model is very certain about the point we've explored and then because of the nature of the ensemble, there is different local maxima in uncertainty outside that, uh, uh, that first valley. So we do gradient ascent over, over the potential train on the white points and find the three black points, right? We retrain over the, the sum of the white and the black points 
and the, the surface starts seeing there is a second minima, which is fine because that lives in the, in the likelihood function. We take care of, of the likelihood of the second minima and we continue poking in finding all these local maxima in uncertainty to fill in the, the gaps. So in this particular model, uh, we go to lower error with fewer points and more likely frames than, than random. Right? Your reference, your difference here should be either random in high dimensions, random in high dimensions will not work, or doing MD, just doing MD for whatever, 100 nanoseconds, bumping into the frames and, and adding them to the pool. We've got another example. I, I won't bore you with one-by-one sort of one details uh, of, of all of these, but we did it for the ammonia inversion, which is sort of a very simple chemical reaction, right, with about seven kilojoule barrier. And we compared a normal mode sampling. Uh, and you can see here in this sort of uh, uh, two-dimensional projection, the normal mode sampling points are all across a tight uh, region of, of phase space, right? They really don't distort the molecule too much. Um, and we compare with random sampling with a, a small displacement or a large displacement. And again, if you displace the atoms very little, the phase space is highly likely, but it doesn't really explore a lot of uncertain regions. And with, uh, with uh, long distortions, we get to add to the pool. You can see these this white points here, right? This is the energy of the, of the frames we visit and how far they are from the, from the origin. So we get to distort the molecule geometrically a lot, but we also visit these unhelpful states that, that do not relate to the, to the phase space we would actually explore in the simulation. And then I've got a real example. I told you I like silicates. So, so this is my first encounter in this talk with silicates. This is a class of materials that have big pores, the crystalline pores, so that they're rigid and like protein pockets that move around. These are pockets that don't move around and people use these for catalysis and separations and cat litter. So if, if you've got a cat, you've got some zeolites in, in your at home. Um, so we were interested in the diffusion of organic molecules in these silicates. And we start off with uh, some data from uh, um, random geometry. So there's 7,000 random geometries, random poses, and about 10,000 frames from MD of these molecules, about uh, 500 molecule pore combinations. We train the first model, we do either sort of a single uh, model trajectories and they explode. So they literally, they're completely useless, right? Because they explode 77% of the time. When we do ensembles, it improves a tiny bit. And this is the reason why, uh, uh, why Oleg sort of uh, mentioned that Annie runs ensembles because you get better trajectories because you use the average forces rather than single model choice of forces. And here we add 5,000 points from the trajectories that, that we run. And here we add 500 points from the, from the adversarial attacks on uncertainty. And you can see that a lot fewer points helped make the model a bunch better than the, uh, than the individual. So we're, we're kind of excited about this and we've taken it one extra step uh, to create uh, potentials for amorphous systems from the bottom up. So rather, uh, we saw some simulations today that were trained on, on data from periodic boundary simulations from, from solid bulk simulations. Um, the problem with those is that best you can afford is PBE, GGA, so, so a generalized gradient approximation uh, exchange correlation potentials. Uh, and I think for people that care about molecules, that's, that's too little, right? We want to do hybrid, we want to do double hybrid, we want to do couple cluster. Uh, so we're interested in training a potential for, for silicate species in water as gas phase molecules and then transfer it to, to bulk. And in this case, the whole adversarial attack doesn't really work because in the bulk, uh, the amount of atoms we have is larger than fits in our simulator, right? We cannot simulate 5,000 atoms or 1,000 atoms with, with our gas phase DFT in, a, in a, an affordable time. So we do attribution. It's related, it's the same gradient, it's the gradient of the uncertainty with respect to atomic positions, but instead of, uh, distorting the system, we just use it to highlight the higher sensitivity regions. So for instance, right, this is, this is a bulk simulation of silica in water. So we, we apply the same derivative, but we only, instead of following the gradients, we just pick the atoms or the chemical environments with the highest uh, uncertainty gradient. This is like a, 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 a class, uh, what do you call it? A class activation maps, right? Where you take the gradient of, of the output with respect to the, uh, input of the network and signal which spaces, which spaces in the input correlate to, uh, to the output. So we are able to identify these little regions in, in the uh, simulation that are contributing to the uncertainty. We cut them out 
and we run DFT only for just those chemical environments that are that are annoying us. So in principle, this this is compatible with uh, with any other simulator and any other neural network architecture. And and in principle, it should help folks um, plug all these holes in the in the neural network potential. And for instance, this is a bunch of frames we just put to the side. That's really bad frames um, that we put to the side. And then we periodically test with if we're getting better at these bad environments. And you can see that, that we do get better at these unseen environments as we do this sort of adversarial or this attribution and at these little pockets of, of uh, molecular environment that are, that are missing from the training data. So uh, we, we went from a, you know, a 11 kcal, 300 kcal per mole error on, on the active learning to one kcal per mole, uh, 0.02 per atom because some, some of the frames are bigger than others. And, and we've got a, a really fun reactive water potential that gets us the right diffusivities, uh, the right structure for water. Well, it's, it's a little bit of a structure there, but uh, works for silica too. It gets us the right energy for, for quartz and for zeolites. And, and, and it gets us the, a reasonable pKW of water with metadynamics. So in principle, by, by constructing this uh, molecular to amorphous bulk, potential, uh, we've been able to, to create sort of a, a transferable um, a way to fill up the holes in the, in the potential. And with this, I'll, I'll shut up and thank the team and you folks. Hi, Rafa. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, I have a question about, okay, so you're showing these different adversarial or, or these examples that are being troublesome and then kind of uh, augmenting your data set. Um, do you find that different styles of models need more or less or learn more or less well from uh, these additional examples? So I, I think that there is agreement that um... Uh, and, and this goes back to the inductive bias question. I think, you know, I have a slide and I took it out because I take too long to, to tell it, but we should leverage our, our inductive biases, right? We're unlike faces or, you know, text. We know the rules of the game. They're expensive, but we know, right? We've got our, our Hamiltonians. We've got our Schrodinger equation. We know the rules of this game. It's just expensive to play it sort of with, in full resolution. Um, and I think the evidence says that equivariant models learn faster and with less data. So I switched, by the way, when I stopped saying it was net, it's because it was pain. So we switched uh, models in 2021. Uh, uh, we switched to pain. So the, the silicate stuff I showed is, is pain, for instance, which is equivariant. And it seems, I don't think people, people have only presented their own scalings, but it seems all the equivariant models with L1 or L1-ish scale sort of favorably compared to all the equivariant models with L0. So yes, uh, I think equivariance has been one of those things that has made these models better. And, and in that sense, yes, we see that some models learn better than others, but we haven't really sort of done that in the context of active learning. We're just going by the standard scalings from everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, or still this does one. that one work as well? And hopefully these are open. Great. Great talk. Uh, I have a question about the states that you're visiting uh, when you um, do the optimization with the uh, with the force uncertainty. So, like holes in a force field sometimes turn out to be in kind of bonkers places. I, I, I think a number of people here have discussed now, like in, in chats about like, oh yeah, my molecule did this strange thing. So when you get to those remote, like. Sometimes the QM itself becomes uh, untrustworthy, especially if a bond is broken or a molecule, an atom is flown off across the box. How do you how do you handle those cases? Or do you pick something earlier along the, the descent path? Or what do, you, what do you do to make sure that your sampling states really compress your training data? That's, that's a good point. So there is a temperature hyperparameter on, on the likelihood of the frames, right? So if we, if we name down to 10,000 degrees, we will see the plasma stuff I was talking about. Um, and then I will also say that both the empty sampling and the way we do the acquisition are kind of semi-local. They're local, right? We're going, gradient ascent will need to start from somewhere and MD will also follow from the previous frame. Meaning that I think the simulations break when something goes bonkers, but it was right before bonkers, there was, there was a transition 
between the ridiculous geometry with ridiculous energy. Like you shouldn't have gotten in there in the first place. So it's not just that that point was bad, but the path getting to that point broke. So the locality of it in principle finds those, right? So we sort of wall up, I think more, more than finding that bonkers geometry, we wall up uh, access to that bonkers geometry so that it won't be visited because it shouldn't in, in the actual simulation. Thank you very much, great talk. Um, I was very interested in your objective for uh, the, this uh, gradient ascent for um, uh, finding the out of reserve perturbation. It looked like some kind of product of some probability times the uncertainty, right? And what, what, is, uh, what is your thinking behind uh, adding this uh, probability term? Yes, that otherwise, and, and I think folks sort of that have done this, it will be unable to that question again. Maximizing uncertainty will drive the system to just ridiculous arrangements of atoms, right? Where you have like 27 sulfurs in, in a string and, and all silly things that are extremely high energy and extremely low likelihood. So they will never show up, not even as a rare event. They will never show up in a, in a Boltzmann distribution, right? You will see them once in the edge of the universe in your MD. Um, so we need to make sure that we drive the system to what we need, which is likelihood right we want to we want to have frames that are representative of the final distribution we, we seek to access which is this but overall of phase space um, so everything is boltzmann weighted when you visit it so we need to boltzmann weight our, our search uh, for these points plus the uncertainty of finding you know highly boltzmann likely and really bad for the network at the same time great. Thank uh, thanks so much for the great talk uh, this question is a little bit probably outside the scope of the talk, but I'm just kind of interested in, in your thoughts. Um, and that's when, when you're sort of uh, comparing convergence and you were looking at that a PMF of free energy and things looked like they were converging. Um, have you thought about trying to measure something that's more dynamical as opposed to an equilibrium ensemble measurement? Because you, know, you can imagine that the free energy might look good in an ensemble sense, but you know the dynamics might be perturbed in some interesting way. So have you thought about looking at something like a, a committer or reactive paths or something like that? Yes, yes. We, we've been thinking about differentiable collective variables for a bit now. And, and, and uh, I finally sort of I connected with folks that, that know what they're doing. So yes, uh, we've done a differentiable molecular simulations like, like the Torch and D cloud. Um, and for instance, you can, you can make your potential fit some collective sort of uh, average property or some dynamic property. Uh, it turns out, we, so we've done this, we've done an end-to-end -end molecular uh, simulation when we learn the uh, per potential for water that reproduces the velocity autocorrelation. But it turns out the velocity autocorrelation is like, doesn't have any information. Any potential will just decay very quickly. So we really haven't found kinetic objectives to fit to that were better than the thermodynamic objectives to fit to. But this is, this is a place where there is a lot going on and I'm happy to chat more about it. Could we have the next speaker, Luis, come up and start getting set up while we take another question? Thanks for the talk. I, I was really reminded with the uh, holes analogy of you know, robustness research, things like computer vision, where you change a single pixel or something and everything changes. But the way they do that is not you know, the way people try to solve that is not through active learning and getting more data. It's through, you know, trying to change some things about your machine learning, like Lipschitz constants of like how quickly your energy might change or your forces might change. I was wondering whether you had thought about doing like things like that and instead of this, it sounds quite like a, it seems like it works, but it sounds quite a an expensive and involved process to do something. You may be able to just change something about your function in order to, to get the same effect. Uh, <laughs> I, I've talked with folks about this and, and uh, adding more inductive bias about the nature of the task we're learning. But again, and I think it relates back, we, we had this conversation in the break. The, what we saw with the gradient fields or, or the sort of fake force field that, that as, as you called it, you're adding a bias, an inductive bias that's saying, my environments are parabolic. Everything around, for every frame that I give you, things are parabolic around it. Uh, which I think is a great idea. Like I, I was texting my students, we need to do this. It's 3 a.m. and I'm, I'm slacking everybody. I think it's, it's, I think it's fantastic. I think it's great. And it would do that sort of thing we were talking earlier. It's like it would wall up the local environment towards, towards craziness because you know everything is uphill in parabolically. 
So yes, I think it makes sense. It will help with the local part, uh, maybe not so much with sort of rare events and, and things that are supposed to happen, but with, with sort of different likelihoods than, than the bad potential would say. Thank you, folks. Thank Rafa again.